morning, everybody. Welcome to everybody in the room, to everybody watching online, everybody in Westside, everybody at our Chatham site, and hello to everybody at our Kitchener site. My name's Pete. I'm one of the pastors here, and you're joining us for a new series that is perfect if you like came on Easter and you don't usually come, and you were like, I'll give them one more try. This is, a, this is a perfect series for you because this series, which we're calling Good News, is all about getting back to the basics. Back to the basics of Christianity. Back to the basics of the story of the Bible. What I find when I talk to people about the Bible, you, have you read your Bible? Do you read the Bible? You listen to culture and what culture says about the Bible? You'll find things like, well, I try to read it, but... It's really long. And, and I try to read it, but, you know, you can open it up to just about any page, and there's someone dying, like being murdered. There's, you can open it up to a page in here, and there's a, part, there's a part where a father kills his daughter because he thinks that's what God wants him to do. And you go, and it's all good news, people. You know, there's, there's other parts in here talk about how, how God's telling people to kill other people. Good news? I don't know. It feels sometimes like you got to get this away from the idea this is good news. You can, you can read through this and there's murder, there's blood, there's confusing parts, there's, there's, there's dis, dis, um, disturbing parts, there's bloody parts. And then you could be reading a story that like is moving along like the book of Exodus and then suddenly halfway through the book, God becomes an interior designer. And he's all concerned with fabrics and materials and colors and getting the feng shui of the tabernacle right. You're like, what is this book? What are we supposed to do with this thing? It's so long and there's so much to it. And yet at the core of the story, the story that this book is telling us is a story of good news. And so what I hope to do in this series is get us back to the basics so that you will be able to read this book. So that you'll be able to read this book without getting distracted. Because some of the things that can happen, sometimes you get, you get frustrated with this book and so you just don't read it. You think, oh, I know what that's about. I, I'm not, it's not for me. Or perhaps even worse you start to emphasize parts of the story that aren't supposed to be the main emphasis. Christians do this all the time. We were like, oh, this part, let's make this part the most important part. We'll build a whole church around it. We'll build a whole denomination around it. You're know, like, that maybe is worse than just saying like, I'll just put it aside and let other people handle it for a while. So my hope is that this series will help you get back to reading it, help you get back to understanding it better, and eventually help you become a person who is more and more sharing the good news in your life. And so today, really all I want to do is build, is put one brick down, one brick. So I'm not going to say everything. I can't say everything and I'm going to leave stuff out and you're going to be like, what about this, Pete? Hopefully later on in the series. But today, all I want to do is one foundational brick, one foundational piece and before we get to that piece, I've got a couple, couple things to note. A couple things to note here. Where's my clicker? Here we go. A couple things to note. One is that I'm kind of modeling this series off of a book that I have found extremely helpful called The Gospel Precisely by Matthew Bates. I think we have a couple copies in the resource room. So like sneak out during the prayer and you can be one of the people to get, to get that. It's only like 10 bucks on Amazon Kindle. It's only about 100 pages. I've read a lot of books on this topic. This one's the best because it is precise. You know, sometimes you read a story and they start telling you about their kids and you're like, I don't care about your kids. Tell me the thing that, you, that I want to learn. This book is precise. It gets to the point, makes the argument really clearly. So I'm kind of modeling this series after this book. And so I wanted to throw that out there as a resource to you. A couple other things to note before we get there. A couple other things to note. Um, I hope that you won't get bored or kind of like frustrated with some of the technical details that we're gonna go through. Because there's, there's a part of me that can, like I see your faces when I'm talking, and I can tell when like I have, when I'm doing a part where you're like, mm, just tell me the life application. 
And I'm like, no, no, you need to understand this part of the Bible and how the Bible works. And you're like, just tell me what I'm supposed to do. I'm like, first we got to learn about the story. And that's step one. What is the story that we are a part of? And then we go, how do we live in 2023? You can't begin with 2023 and then just impose that on the Bible. So, so when we get back to fundamentals... You, you might have a part of your brain that goes, this is kind of boring. Kind of like when I play basketball with my kids. I have two young sons. They're nine and eight. And when I play basketball with them, when I'm like teaching them things, they'll always be like, dad, show us some moves. Which part of me is like, I love that they think I have moves. <laughs> I don't have any moves. But they're like, dad, show us some moves. And I'll be like, okay, let me teach you some things. I'll put some cones down. I'll be like, okay, guys, just dribble around these cones. And they're like... Dad, that's so boring. I'll be like, yeah, but that's going to help you in a game. They're like, like, no, no, show us like through the legs. Show us something that like Kyrie would do. Show us some of his, I'm like, I'm like, what? Well, that's, you're not going to use that in a game. They're like, oh, well, we want to at least shoot. I'm like, okay, practice your layups because that's the main way you're going to score as a little kid. One dribble, two steps, boom, off the backboard. Practice that. Dad's so boring. I want to just throw that out there to you that you might have that feeling. You might be like, this is so boring, but it's fundamental. And when we get away from the fundamentals as Christians, we get ourselves into trouble. So hopefully you're going to learn something new. But if you don't, even if you don't, think about, okay, this is the, this is the theological way that we talk about this. How do I contemporize this? And we're going to eventually get there by the end of the series. But if you're, if you're a little bit like, I know this, I've heard this before, start to think, like, how would, I cont- how would I say this to someone who doesn't care anything about the Bible? How would I say this to someone who doesn't know anything about church? And with that, let's begin. If you lived 2,000 years ago, in the Roman Empire, you would have been familiar with the idea or the expression, the word good news. In the Greek, it's euangelion, which is the word that we find in our Bible. But it gets translated as gospel or good news. These are all synonymous. They all mean the same thing. And if you were living in the Roman Empire 2,000 years ago, you would be familiar with the concept of every once in a while, perhaps a messenger would come. He'd come maybe running into the village, maybe heralding something. Maybe he had a trumpet and some other guys with him. But you were familiar that from time to time, good news, gospel, euangelion, would come to your city, would come to your village. It might be the good news that a battle had taken place, that a battle had taken place and the Roman Empire has been victorious and we have taken new lands. It might be the good news that a place was defended, that the hordes were outside the city and we defended the city. The good news that the Roman Empire is safe and secure. It might be good news that a new emperor has been born. Oh, Caesar Augustus has been born. Let me tell you the gospel of Caesar Augustus. It might be something that the emperor has done, the good news of some great peace that he has brought. But if you live 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire, you were familiar with the idea of good news. You knew this term. So imagine what it was like when a group of people, kind of a strange group of people, we call them the Jewish people, they started talking about their own good news. Well, well, what's their good news about? It must be about the emperor. I mean, anything outside of the emperor or about Rome, extremely dangerous. And it was extremely dangerous. But they started proclaiming their own good news And their good news could be summarized as this, that Jesus, the one that they follow, had become their king. That Jesus had become the king. This is the way, the most common way that we find in the Bible that the good news is summarized most precisely. I want to show you a couple of examples, but before I do, I got to do a little bit of a translation thing here. When we read the Bible, we'll read that Jesus is the Christ. Christ meaning anointed one, which could also mean Christ the King. Okay, so when we read, I think, do I have a slide about this? No, I don't. Okay, so when we read these next examples and you read the word Christ, I want you to just put in there King because they're synonymous. It means the same thing. And so I want you to see how just, I'm going to give you four examples here 
how the gospel of the early Christians, the gospel of the early church, was about proclaiming that Jesus was the new king. At the end of his Pentecost sermon, after, after Peter has talked about, he's, talked, he's quoted a psalm from David, he's quoted the prophet Joel, he, he's, he's talked about all these different things, he's talked about the crucifixion of Jesus, he sums it all up with a therefore. So he makes this whole argument, and then he says, therefore, everything I just told you, this is the whole point, this is the summarizing point, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and and Christ. On the day of Pentecost, when the church is formed, when thousands join the church, Peter summarizes his sermon. He summarizes the good news that he's proclaiming with this. Jesus has become Lord and Christ. Jesus is King. Later on in Acts, once the church is formed, we get a description of what their life was like. It says, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news. Well, what did they, what did they never stop? They never stopped proclaiming what? The good news, the good news of what? The good news that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the King. Day after day, Christians met, the early church met, and they never stopped proclaiming the good news. The good news about what? Jesus the Christ. In Acts chapter 7, we get the first martyr of the church, Stephen, and the church scatters. And in Acts chapter 8, after the church has scattered, we get this little description. Now those who were scattered went about gospeling the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaim to them the Christ. The church gathers day after day and they talk about the good news that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the King. The church scatters and what do they do? They gospel about this news that Jesus is the Christ. One more example. The earliest gospel that we have, the first one that is written, Mark opens with this line. And many believe that the opening line of Mark could be seen as Mark's title because they didn't have titles the way that we make titles. And so your opening line, you could read it as like, "What? this is the title of my book. This is what my whole book is about. This is how Mark begins his gospel. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. Simple point that I want to make. For the early Christians, the good news was the announcement of a king, of the Christ, of the anointed one, Jesus. That's the brick. That's the return to fundamentals that I want to talk about this morning. When we talk about the good news that we have, before we go anywhere else with it and talk about any other pieces to it, we begin with Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the King. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord. You'll hear me say these different expressions throughout the series, and I want you to hear them all as the same thing. They all mean the same thing, but see that as the brick. You're not getting bored, right? Not bored. Pete, show some tricks through the legs. Come on. Let's do. No. Simple. I know. Simple, foundational, and we're going to build on it. Now, here's the thing. If you're reading through the Bible, the part that we just talked about only comprises this much. This is the New Testament. This is what begins with the Gospels and then the Epistles, and this is is the Jesus part. And so you might think, okay, so the good news is this part, and this part is all about proclaiming that there's a king and his name is Jesus. And if you're a questioning person, you then say, so what about all this part? Let's just rip that part out and get rid of it, which some people have tried, and the church has said, no, 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 we don't do that. Because this part leads us into this part. And this part is all about awaiting a king. This part, the mega theme of this part of the Bible that sets up King Jesus is all about the expectation that one day God will send a king. And one day this king will come and he will establish a kingdom. So when you hear king, think kingdom. And when you hear kingdom, think king. They go together. If you hear there's going to be a new kingdom, then you go, well, who's going to be the king? And if you hear there's a new king, then you go, well, what's his kingdom like? There was always this expectation that this would happen. 
Now, a couple more terms before we get into this a bit more. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, we get the word Messiah. In the New Testament, we get the word Christ in the Greek. Both of these mean anointed one, which means both of them, Christ equals Messiah equals King. So if you've heard these terms before, maybe they're brand new to you, but you, they're kind of all interchangeable depending on what you're talking about. And so depending on your translation, as I went through those verses in Acts earlier, your translation may not have had Christ, it may have actually had Messiah. But all of those words, we're gonna think of them as synonymous, okay? Messiah, Christ, King, wherever you see them. Old Testament, Messiah, New Testament, Christ, they get interchanged, with, they get them interpreted differently in different translations, but I want you to see these as the same. So in the Old Testament, there is a constant drumbeat of, we need a king. We need a good king. We need God to send one who will establish a kingdom that will last forever. And I could show you lots of examples. We could go lots of places. We could read 20 different passages easily where this expectation is. And I just want to show you one of them just as one example. And it's a place where the prophet Nathan is talking to the current king, David. And he's going to give him a prophecy about what David's son will do. But it has this like double feature to it where it also talks about this kingdom that will never end, that will be established after David is dead, which means that it can't just be about David's son because David's son became king before David died. So there's this prophecy given about this kingdom that will never end. And it has this sort of, it's kind of about Solomon, but it's also about another one who will come much later. We find it in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Nathan says to David on behalf of God, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. There's sort of this like Solomon, that's David's son's name. He's gonna build the temple, and that's gonna be like the house for, the, for God's name. But it also points to Jesus who will establish a greater house, who will be a place where God dwells, and he will establish the church where God's presence will dwell. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul. Saul was the king before David. He's the first king of Israel. Whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Language like this is filled, the Old Testament's filled with this. We need a kingdom that will come with a king that will be established forever. And so in that big, thick part of the Bible that I was holding earlier, there's this, there is this longing. There is this expectation all throughout this part. This expectation for a good king. Not just any king. We don't just need another king. We need a good king. And if you're reading through your Bible in the, in the year, I looked, at, I looked it up because, to be honest, I fell behind in my Bible reading for the year. But if you're on track... You're in the part of the Bible called First and Second Kings, which give lists and summaries of the different kings that Israel has. And one thing that you'll find, it's, it's almost comical how repetitive it is, but as each king is listed, it says like, sometimes it says, he did some good things, he did some bad things, but it almost always, like most of them say, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Even when it doesn't say that, it's like he did some good things, he did some bad things, but he didn't get rid of all the other fake gods. He didn't get rid of all the false idols. He allowed the people to worship the wrong gods. And so he wasn't a good king. You read through the books of Kings and you go, man, so many Kings, King after King after King, and none of them can lead the people. None of them can establish a good kingdom. And as you read through this, you should have a longing. You're like, I, wouldn't it be amazing if we could finally get a king who could lead us in the right direction, faithfully, consistently? There's, a, there's another hope, not just for a good king, but that this, this good king would be a uniting king. Earlier in the book of 2 Samuel, just two, two chapters before what we read there, chapter five, there's this moment that's kind of like, 
prophetic in some ways where, where David is hiding out. David has been anointed king, but he hasn't stepped into that yet. So he's the future king, but he's not fully the king yet. And he's united some of the southern kingdom, but the northern kingdom is kind of all split up and rebellious. And what happens is these northern tribes come to David and David in this really simple way unites all of Israel back together again. There were 12 tribes of Israel that had been fractured and were warring and fighting with each other. And David brings them all together. And the hope as the history would go on from there and then the, the nation would fracture again and the tribes would scatter again was that maybe one day another king will come. And maybe when that king comes, he'll do the same thing and he'll reunite the tribes of our people again. The 12 tribes of our people. You may not know a lot about Christianity, but how many disciples did Jesus have? 12. Why do he have 12? So you could play five on five with a sub for each side? You know, he had 12 to symbolically represent that he was the new David. He's the new King David, the better King David who will unite all of the tribes once again. And on top of that, in the Jewish understanding of things, once Israel was established and once a king of Israel was established, that king wouldn't just be king of Israel and bring blessing to the nation of Israel. That king would become the king of the whole world and would bring blessing to the entire world. All throughout that big fat part of the Bible before we get to Jesus is filled with longing for a king, a good king, a united king, a king who would bring blessing into the entire world. I make that point so that if you are writing notes, you'll write something along these lines. Jesus isn't a new character in the story that the Bible's telling. He's not a, oh, the story was going this way, and then Jesus just came out of nowhere. Jesus is the long-awaited king. Jesus is fulfilling, he is completing a story that has been told for hundreds of years leading up to him. He holds the whole Bible together. One last point here. We talked about the New Testament. We talked about the early church. Early church's good news was Jesus is the Christ. This is the block. This is the brick that we're putting in place. Jesus is the Christ. That's the beginning of the good news. We're going to build everything else off of that. We looked at how the Old Testament leads into this, has, has expectation and longing and anticipation for this news. Well, what about Jesus? What was Jesus' good news? Did he go around saying that he was king? Not exactly. Probably because explicitly saying it that way would get you killed so fast that you wouldn't have much time to like explain yourself and uh, leave us with lots of teachings that we have. So what Jesus did was he went around proclaiming a kingdom, which like I said before, is kind of synonymous with king. If you go around proclaiming a kingdom, eventually people are gonna go, who's the king of this kingdom? And Jesus would, I feel like Jesus was always pointing people like, that's gonna be me. But don't tell anybody that yet because I want to teach some more before we get to the part where you kill me. Jesus went around proclaiming the kingdom. Just a couple examples of this to show you. One is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. In Mark chapter one, when Jesus begins his ministry, it says after John was put in prison, so John went before Jesus. When John's ministry was over, he's put in prison. Jesus steps out and he begins his ministry. He goes into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel, euangelion, good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Bracketed by gospel. What is it? The announcement. The kingdom of God has come near. What should you do? You should repent and believe. We'll get to those in later weeks, what you should do. But the announcement is that a kingdom is here. The kingdom's kind of hidden. It won't be big and flashy like people were expecting, but it's here. It's growing. It's like a seed that's been planted in the ground. And the king is here. He's the one who's speaking. In Luke, when Jesus begins his ministry, he's in a synagogue one day. And he goes up to the front and he's going to read the scroll. He's going to read the passage for the day. 
It says he looks for Isaiah and he, and he goes through Isaiah and he finds the place that he wants to read. He finds the place where he wants to begin his ministry. And look what he says. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me, christened me. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has made me. He has confirmed that I am the Christ. I am the anointed one. And because I'm the anointed one, he's anointed me to proclaim gospel, good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus went around proclaiming the kingdom is here. The king is here. And I want to point this out to you so that you realize that what Jesus was proclaiming wasn't something that was going to happen later. It was something for the here and now. It was the year of the Lord's favor was beginning right here, right now. When we put this brick in place that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is king, it is a brick that we put in place about something that is happening right here, right now. And we'll talk about that in future weeks. Now, I've shared messages like this enough times that I know that there is always a little bit of, Pete, what about sin? What about forgiveness? What about grace? What about mercy? Those are all going to be there. But we're going to build all of those off of the brick that Jesus is the Christ. I've heard all my life the saying, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Great expression. Holds two really important things together. But here's what I've recently been rethinking. And you can go home and chew on this. And you're going to talk about this more deeply in your life groups, actually. It's one of the pieces of the study this week. But if you say that he's Lord and Savior, sometimes it's easy to kind of make those two separate things. Like, like I'm going to understand this piece and I'm going to understand this piece. But what I'm coming to understand more and more fully is that a better way to say it is that Jesus is Savior because he's king. He is the king who saves. If he's not the king, he can't save you. And so the reason why this sermon is so important, the reason why this sermon is fundamental, the reason why this sermon is the brick that we need to put in place first is because we don't want to end up with a Christianity that doesn't have a king. And it's happened before. There are still versions of Christianity floating around that have this, we're, we're Christians without a Christ. We have a, we have a savior but we don't exactly have a king. Jesus is the Christ, is the first brick of the good news. And it is the fulfillment of the longing inside every human heart, whether you know it or not. The longing for a good king to come. The longing for someone to come to unite the whole world. The some, someone to come and be the judge and bring justice into this world of, of greed and suffering. We, we need somebody to come and sort all of this out. And the beginning of the good news is that one has come. And his name's Jesus. So as I wind down the message today, I've got three questions for you to think about. The first one is... Does your gospel have a king? Is your gospel about a king? Is the gospel that you accepted about a king? Is the gospel that you share with other people about a king? And if it is, and if maybe you're thinking about jumping into this story with us, then is he your king? Would you like him to be your king? Sometimes we'll say, we're not about religion. We're about a relationship. We're about a relationship with God. That's great. Relationship, wonderful. Just let me add a little thing to, to the end of that whenever you think about that. It's a relationship with a king. It's a relationship with a king. It's not a relationship of equals. You are invited into a relationship with a king, a good king, a servant king, 
the best king you could ever imagine. He loves you more than you love yourself. But he's a king. Is Jesus your king? Is he the king of how you organize your family life? Does he have say over that? Is he the king of your work life? Does he dictate things that you will and won't do at work? Is he the king over your bank account? Over how you spend your money? Jesus, it's all yours. You're the king. How do, how do you want me to, what do you want me to do with the resources you've given me? Is he the king of your personal life? I listened to a sermon this week by uh, Bishop Robert Barron and he had a great just a great way of putting this. He said, like, if Jesus is king over your personal life, it means that there's nothing that you will do when you're by yourself, you know, when nobody else is around, that, that you would do without being able to imagine, like, Jesus is sitting right here next to me as I do this. Are there any parts of your life where you kind of, like, walk Jesus outside the room and you go, like, Jesus, just stay there for a second and you close the door and then something happens, something that you're involved in and you're like, Jesus isn't a part of this. Well, then, then Jesus isn't your king. He's not the king over your personal life. And maybe you need to reflect on that. Jesus, I don't know how I'm going to get let you into this room, but come on in and become the king here too. The king who will save me from this place. Is he your king? And lastly, do you have a longing for this king to return and for his kingdom to come in its fullness. His kingdom has been planted and it's beginning, but it's not here in its fullness. Of course, it's not here in its fullness. How could anyone say that in the amount of suffering that we have in the world? But is it the longing of your heart that the king would return and his kingdom would come in its fullness? You know, when there's a part in the Gospels where Jesus' disciples ask him to teach them how to pray. And I thought this week, it's kind of funny, he doesn't give them the sinner's prayer, if you're familiar with that. He doesn't be like, well, here's this, here's this magical prayer that we're going to pray. He gives them a different prayer. It's the only prayer that Jesus ever gives his disciples to pray. And somehow we get away from it sometimes and we make up our own fancy prayers. And we're like, why don't we begin with the fundamentals of the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? And this prayer is filled with longing. Longing for a king and longing for a kingdom. And so I thought we would end this morning by just praying the first part of what we call the Lord's Prayer. Or maybe you call it, you've heard it called the Our Father. I'm gonna say it and then we'll read it together. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Holy meaning, meaning different meaning different, your love, your justice, the way that you are is so different than us. Holy is your name. And here's our desire, that your kingdom would come here, that heaven would come here. And what that's gonna look like is that, that your will is gonna start to be the thing that is done, which means my will will need to take a back seat. That's a heck of a prayer. If you can say that, you're following Jesus. Your will, not my will. That's surrender. Jesus taught us how to long and he taught us how to surrender in this fundamental prayer. And then this first section ends with, may it be on earth as it is in heaven. May heaven come here. Let's pray this together. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, may we not be bored by the fundamentals. Jesus is king. You are the Christ. You are the long-awaited Messiah. You are the core of the story that we have in the Bible. Help us to become learners of this story so that we can become sharers of this story. 
God, we pray for anybody who is, who is new to all of this. Man, what an exciting place to be where we're going back to the fundamentals and you're learning from a great place of building this foundation. I pray that those people would come back and build with us. Jesus, we thank you for all you're doing in the life of our church, in our lives personally, in our families. We love you. We thank you that you are our good king. We pray these things in your name. Amen.